is that the citizens will be able to understand this and they will understand that they are making that they are actually a part of the political process on the highest EU level. And thirdly, something that has until now been discussed much more in political circles and academic circles and not so so widely is the issue of the European political parties. This is an important um, this is a very important consideration because we believe that it is the European political parties that are able, that are those actors that are actually able to bridge the gap between the nationally oriented political debates and the real European debate. It's the European political parties who are there to create European public awareness. And for the first time now, this is why they recognize that the Lisbon Treaty actually stipulates that they are a key factor to achieving trans-European political awareness. And the European Parliament has been an advocate of this for years, if not decades. So we are extremely happy to see that the Commission has come up with a proposal for regulation now, in June, uh, which actually hopefully will give the real means to these political parties to campaign on the EU level and to engage its citizens in the, into the real debates on European issues. We know, like Dominic said, that these elections are considered as, um, unfortunately, still second-order elections, and that, uh, contradictory to what is reality, people think that MEPs are actually uh, some kind of uh, political discards that uh, are just there to fill up the spaces in the, in the European Parliament. Very interestingly, we brought this a mix of, of uh, issues that I described two and three to the uh, to the European citizens in the, one of the recent Eurobarometer polls in June. We asked them the following question: What if at the next European elections the major European political alliances parties would present a candidate for the post of president of the European Commission based on the joint presidency? The citizens would then have a, a possibility to indirectly participate in the election of the president. Would this encourage you more than currently to cast your vote at the European elections? You can see the results here. It is quite encouraging for us and uh, might be uh, surprising for some, but more than 50%, so 54% of people would be more inclined to, inclined to vote if this was the case, which actually shows that people do want faces and people, people, people do want politics. People do want politics as politics are a mobilizing factor. We have the economic crisis. We cannot avoid it in our discussion. It is there. It is still here, deeper than in 2009. Already when we were devising the 2009 campaign, uh, we could not avoid the subject, whereas this time we will certainly not be able to avoid it, and we do not want to avoid it. Again, asking the citizens of Europe uh, what they would like the Parliament to, the Parliament, the European Parliament, what issues they would like uh, to, the Parliament to deal with, what comes on top is not surprising, is poverty, social inclusion, jobs, economic recovery. Communication tools, communication tools, there's been a real revolution. We know that the real revolution for us as public communicators was brought along by the internet. But even more so in the recent years, in the last couple of years, it's the social media. The social media are actually, for us, an amazing opportunity because they're a perfect fit for the open ethos of the European Parliament because they enable the two-way flow of communication. At the same time as they create opportunities, they create expectations. So we have to be aware of this. We have to um, streamline our communication efforts into social media, and as you can imagine, these are not the times when the European institutions will be getting more expertise, will be getting more, uh, more resources. Therefore, we have to deal with the, what we have and streamline all this communication expertise into, uh, into these new platforms. Today, we can be proud to say that the Parliament has successfully, until now, embraced the communication of social media. We have half a million Facebook fans, only as their communication services. MEPs have 1.6 million fans. We have 22 Twitter accounts in all languages. And we are considered, we are uh, going towards 1 million Facebook fans by the mid-2014. 
the next shift that will have to happen in the social media is not just being present, but it's engaging in the conversations that happen on the social platforms. It's going with where people are, and people are online. And it's um, being able to actually talk to people online to know where opinions are being made. And this is something that we are currently looking into in our social media strategy that goes uh, towards the elections and beyond. Uh, I know there is a workshop on social media, but it is such a, it is such a popular topic. And uh, as I said, the parliament is very happy to discuss it because we are the leading EU institution uh, in, the, in the use of social media as well as the leading assembly in the, in the world. Uh, and we definitely want to use this as an opportunity and to see how far we can actually push the, uh, the boundaries of communication as a political institution. A couple of words on public opinion. It is important to take public opinion into account. Elections are about citizens, what they have to say. However, public opinion polls can be read in various ways. We all know the, the questions can be asked in various ways. And everybody, I believe, can use the results of this poll to the uh, to, the, uh, to, to whatever they are trying to, to do in their communication activities. Um, so this is a kind of a, a, a provoking statement, but at the same time, we need a basis somewhere. And this is the, what the citizens say. And what citizens say is not always what, uh, what our stereotype is. For example, if we look at uh, at how uh, citizens see uh, the image of the EU. We see that the image of the EU in the last year actually increased by 9%. Nobody would say this in the current uh, confidence crisis. We know that it's overwhelming for everybody. It might come not as a surprise that the European Parliament is, of course, the most recognized institution. Why um, we could discuss this? Uh, does the word parliament incite people to say that they recognize it even though they actually do not? Might be the case, but still, the parliament always comes first, and it is actually um, the absolute majority of Europeans believe that it is the European Parliament, that institution that best represents them on the EU level. And what could come as a surprise? Um, is the fact that already in June 2012, more than a quarter of those asked when the next European elections will take place knew that they will take place in June 2014. Um, maybe the last thing about public opinion would be to say that currently we see a big divide uh, appearing in comparing Euro countries and non-Euro countries. For example, speaking about identity, People from EU countries uh, consider Euro as a very, very strong symbol of the European identity, whereas you can imagine that it's not the same in the, the countries which do not have the Euro. This will be an important element also in when we will be targeting and developing segmentation strategy for the, for the next elections. Where we are today, again, this background, everything that Dominic said, declining turnout, confidence in crisis, why people don't vote, we actually asked them after elections 2009, and it was not because they don't like Europe or because they're extremely Eurosceptic. No, it was because they lack, most people lack confidence in politics. They, they don't think that their vote brings anything. They, they don't know us. So uh, the problem is much more complex than, than, uh, than just uh, summarizing it to Euroscepticism or the bad Europe. It is, it is much more complex than that. And that is why, actually, the European Parliament decided to upgrade its communication strategy immediately after the last elections, taking into account, of course, the results of the, the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty. We decided that uh, communication should change in the sense that the European Parliament has now become a proper parliament. It's a political institution and we need to emphasize its nature as a political institution and to strengthen its ties with the citizens, which of course is very obvious. So we have adopted a series of uh, strategic documents that you can see here. The main, the culmination of all the strategic documents, of course, will be the updating of our communication strategy and of all our 
all our communication efforts, and hopefully we will see this before 2014 and not after 2014. And uh, now I will go in a little bit more into detail about the future campaign, what we are actually preparing, what, along what lines we are thinking. First you have to understand, I'm sure you do understand, that for us, as an administrative communication services, services, it is very important that the campaign that we prepare is institutional, is politically neutral. And what we have to do is pave the way for the political elections campaigns, on which the individual members, uh, candidates, parties, will then build up their own campaigns towards the end of the period. So the aim of the campaign will be to raise awareness of the European Parliament as the only directly elected institution. It might seem obvious, but it is not. Of the fact that the MEPs are advocates of EU citizens' interests and that the Parliament is the house of EU citizens, and that for the first time, like I mentioned before, the results of the elections will be taken into account on the highest political level. And of course, at the end of the day, elections are about politics, and different politicians champion different political outcomes. And by voting, citizens actually decide what kind of Europe they want. Because by supporting a certain party, they support the vision that this party might have of the future of the EU. The dynamics of the parliament and the core axis of the campaign, uh, just to say that this time we will not focus only on the last part of the campaign, which is a go-to-vote campaign. It's an, it's an extremely important part of the campaign. But we believe that there's, there's much more. We could already understand from what I said before that the, the context is extremely complex. Therefore, we want to picture the dynamics of the European Parliament in the following way. We want to communicate policies policies are about impact stories, what happens to citizens in their, in their daily lives, in private life, professional life, how this is positively, how they are positively affected by the, by the, uh, by the policies that are actually being made in the European Parliament. What is the added value of Europe and what is the cost of non-Europe? Because this is something citizens do not ask themselves when they criticize Europe. They do not say, oh, and what if there was not, no Europe, would this actually be better for me? We do have to emphasize this. As I said, the EP is the house of politics and they are mobilizing factors. So we do have to prepare all the platforms and it is our task to um, modernize further our communication tools and we need to have state-of-the-art tools for the politicians to build their campaigns on. And thirdly, values. Uh, you might think that I conveniently slipped this part in uh, after the EU was awarded the Nobel Prize last week, but it is not true. It is in extremely important places to which we often forget to go back to. Um, it is going back to the basics of why, the, why Europe is here, what Europe has achieved, where we came from. And these are the European values. And this. President Barroso in his State of the Union address said this. Uh, President Schulz in his inaugural speech said it, and it is true, the image of Europe is much better outside Europe than in Europe. We have to bring this positive image back to Europe. We have to make the citizens feel pride, and there is reason to feel pride. So, concretely, um, what are we going to improve in our communication efforts? And here I'm sure I'm running out of time, slowly. I'm still okay. Uh, I will try to already draw some parallels with what we could learn from 2009 experience, even though the context was different. Um, we did learn a lot of things. We conducted several internal, internal assessment exercises, and on the basis of this, and on the basis of all the strategic documents, we now know what we have to improve, and we hope we will be able to improve it uh, with the help of all our communication partners. First of all, in our strategy, we will take into account public monitoring, much more than we used to. A novel approach will be a segmentation approach. Of course, the idea, in the ideal world, we will address every European citizen. But in reality, it is impossible for an institution and all our partners to address directly uh, every citizen. Hopefully, we will reach every citizen, but we will address them according to priority targets. 
And when we will come up with priority targets based on public monitoring and behavior analysis, national, uh, national factors, but also other demographic factors, we will come up with a very interesting segmentation exercise. I would be happy to show you already some results, but it is, I'm afraid, a bit too early in the process. Uh, it is just for you to know that this is the way we're working, that we're working currently. I've mentioned communication platforms, building our communication, uh, communication capacity, again, social media, developing listening capacity, and engaging in the platforms, in the conversation, uh, being able to be there where people are. This is going to be extremely important. Uh, just interesting, as an interesting comparison, the European Parliament for the 2009 elections did not hardly existed on social media. Uh, we created a Facebook account a couple of months before, and look where we are today. Today we cannot imagine having any communication activity without the social media. It is a huge, uh, it is a huge development, and we we also have to go more, more uh, to the local and national level, of course, including the social media. This will be an important part of our strategy. Internal communication, or maybe before internal communication, I can say a couple of words on interinstitutional cooperation. We are very happy to note that one of the three interinstitutional priorities for communication is communicating in European elections. We are happy, like you also said before, European elections are not about the European Parliament, they are about Europe. And it's the credibility of Europe that is put at stake. In the Parliament, of course, we have understood this a bit earlier, but we are very happy that uh, and we feel that all our communication partners are actually working now with us in this direction. We'll increase internal communication uh, with our members, with political groups, with European political parties. We will, have to, we will uh, try to facilitate their work the best way we could while staying politically neutral. And, of course, external st stakeholders. They are our multiplier potential. We will include, we will involve the young people. We will uh, make all elements of the information campaign that we will produce on the central level available for all our partners at least a year before the election. This is something that is uh, as well quite novel in our approach because we know that when you are when you are communicating, you need products, you need material, and this time we will try to. Uh, we will try to do this with the help of our uh, inter information offices, which are, of course, the key element of the implementation of the campaign. So, just very, very quickly, uh, I have spoken about most of these things. If you want to go further in details, we can do it, we can do it later. Um, whereas Europe today might be here, whereas we might not really know where Europe is, we think that we know where we have to go when speaking about the European elections. Today, we have devised what we call an umbrella strategy. We have an external agency that is helping us develop a methodology, and we call it the umbrella methodology. Uh, as you can see here, we hope it might protect us against further uh, drop in the electoral turnout. And what we will embrace in this umbrella strategy is everything that I have exposed to you before. Again, what I would like to say is that elections are not about the parliament, they are about Europe. But at the end of the day, this is a responsibility of every single voter, and we cannot do, we cannot do elections on behalf of the voter. Uh, the citizens hopefully will embrace this responsibility thanks to all our joint efforts in the future with a little bit more vigor and enthusiasm. So this is all from me, and hopefully we can uh, develop on this later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nancy. A very interesting start to the debate. Uh, just to remind those who have arrived slightly late, uh, if you want to text me a question or a comment for the panel later to save time, you can do it on 0475 703 183. Uh, just relevant questions. Um, so now let me invite Christophe uh, Christophe Roux to walk us through some fundamental questions which arise when we're talking about citizens' participation and pose some intriguing future oriented questions. With the greatest pleasure, it's 0475 
703, 103.